Good afternoon. Why don't we get started? My name is Doug Irwin. I'm uh, in the Economics Department and uh, co-director of the Political Economy Project. And on behalf of Dan Benjamin, the director of the Dickey Center, it's a pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon on this spring afternoon. Um, just want to remind you about one upcoming Political Economy Project event next uh, Tuesday at this time um, in Filene Auditorium. We have a debate on whether capitalism is rigged with two leading economists, economic historian Deirdre McCloskey and uh, Jason Furman, the former uh, chair of uh, President Obama's uh, Council of Economic Advisors. So that should be an interesting debate on contemporary issues and how we think about uh, capitalism. And uh, speaking of capitalism, we're here to talk this afternoon about China, uh, which has gone through an interesting transformation in recent years. So you, to know the history, uh, you might recall uh, uh, under Mao, uh, they had very statist uh, po uh, policies, communist government, central planning and what have you. Under Deng Xiaoping, they transitioned to a much more open, more liberalizing, privatizing regime. But in recent years, they've moved back in a different direction under President Xi. And that's the uh, context in which our, our afternoon speaker will uh, talk to us about uh, what's been going on in China in recent months uh, and years. Um, I want to introduce uh, Nicholas Lardy. Uh, he's a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics uh, in Washington, DC, a distinguished uh, China observer for many, many years. Before then, he was at the Brookings Institution and the University of Washington. He's the author of many books, but the one he's going to be talking about today has just been released. It's called The State Strikes Back, The End of Economic Reform in China. With that, uh, Mr. Lardy, thank you for coming. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Doug, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to start with reviewing a little bit of what happened after Mao that Doug was talking about, the move towards the market, so that I can contrast it with what has happened in more recent years. I did a book before this one that was called Markets Over Mao. It was about the rise of the market economy and how it fueled China's economic growth, it was responsible for most of the growth of expansion of employment and GDP and so forth. So I'm, I'll just review that. So this is the new book. Um, the two takeaways really are that state-owned enterprises are dragging down China's growth. I think they could do better. I think potential growth is something in the neighborhood of 8%, maybe even a little bit more, but I'll come to that in the conclusion. Uh, the conventional wisdom, Larry Summers uh, and many others say, well, Larry Summers in particular has studied all the countries that have had periods of what he calls super rapid economic growth. I think it's more than 6% for more than six years or something like that. There's something like 40 episodes that can be documented. And he says the greatest statistical regularity is when, when the fast growth ends, they go back to 2% per capita. That's what he calls convergence to the mean, and that's what he said, that's what he has predicted is in line for China. He says, I can't tell you when it's gonna happen, or why it's going to happen. It's just the most uh, regular statistical pattern that we see in countries that have had fairly rapid uh, economic growth. I'm saying, well, maybe they'll go to 2%, but I think if they adopt better policies, they could go up from where they are now. Um, she started out talking about economic reform at the so-called third plenum in November of 2013, unveiled a very, very comprehensive blueprint for further economic reform. But we didn't see much action uh, over the last uh, five, six years. He's concentrated on his anti-corruption campaign, and he has concentrated on industrial policy. Uh, he's always talked about making state enterprises bigger, which we'll talk about later. Uh, he's, the result has been that banks are lending more and more money uh, to the least efficient state companies. So here's the review. Why did I think China was heading so strongly in the direction of a market economy? I'll give you some details, but there was price reform. China created a legal system that allowed private firms for the first time. More credit went to these more efficient private companies. Um, more investment was undertaken by those companies. And they displaced uh, state firms, particularly in the industrial sector, which was very important in China's economy um, at the beginning of the reform process. Um, so on the lending side, um, this is what was happening uh, on loans. Uh, more than half of all the loans from the banking system in the first part of this century were going uh, to private companies, and the share going to state companies was only about a third. Some collective companies got some loans, some foreign companies got some loans, but these were the two biggest recipients of 
money loans from the banking system. And you can see the private sector was actually doing reasonably well. And one of the reasons they could grow relatively rapidly, obviously, the combination of uh, greater productivity as measured by return on assets and uh, increasing access to bank capital. At the beginning of reform, they got nothing. Uh, they barely existed. Um, as a result, you can see that private investment grew very, very rapidly uh, uh, up until 2011. Um, private investment was growing almost three times more rapid. Everybody's investment was growing, but private investment was growing three times more rapidly than state investment. So the share, which I'm showing here, the percentage of investment being undertaken by private firms was going up very rapidly. And as you can see, the state share was falling. In the industrial sector, which I mentioned very important in the Chinese economy at this time, and this is looking all the way back to 1978, um, State firms produced about four-fifths of all the output at the beginning. There were then collective firms that produced most of the rest. And many of these collective firms were under local government control. So you could think of them as being kind of quasi-state companies. But as reform unfolded, prices were liberalized. And the manufacturing sector and the industrial sector more generally were opened up to private firms. The share of output being produced by state firms decline very steadily. There's one little discontinuity in the data for some definitional things. But by 2011, they were only producing about a quarter of China's industrial output. This was not because of privatization for the most part. This was a process that I prefer to call displacement. Private firms were more efficient. They got better access to capital. They grew more rapidly. So State industrial output was a much higher in 2011 than it was in 1978, but the share had come down uh, very, very uh, dramatically. Most of the rest was being produced by either pri indigenous private companies or foreign companies. Um, and then there was a transformation also of exports. We always think of China as being a big exporting country. And originally, if you go back to the mid-90s, most of the exports were being produced by state companies. Foreign firms became very, very important as a result of the liberalization of foreign investment, the creation of special economic zones, and so forth. Their share peaked out, however, in around 2005 and is gradually coming down. But after 2000, 2001, which is roughly when China came into the World Trade Organization, private firms became very important sources of exports. And if you look at it on an incremental basis, in the last three or four years shown in this diagram, private firms became the biggest source of the growth of exports. So those are some of the reasons that the private sector seemed to be doing very well, responsible for most of the growth of output, most of the growth of uh, exports, and getting better and better access to uh, financial resources. Now, since 2013, which you will probably recognize is roughly the time Xi Jinping came into power, I guess he assumed his party position in the fall of 2012, his government position in the spring of 2013. What has happened? A lot of these things have been reversed. You know, the credit is now going mostly to state companies, much, much less than private companies. The share of investment by private companies continue to go up slowly but then uh, much more slowly plateaued and has gone down. So I'm sorry, if you could collaborate and use the mic at the moment. OK. Um, the third bullet is that for the first time ever in the reform period, uh, State firms are now growing more rapidly than private firms. I think it's partly because private firms are getting squeezed out in terms of access to credit. And we've had a very significant number of mergers of big state companies, which I think has been very anti-competitive. One of the most important characteristics of the earlier period was that not only was it a market economy with market-determined prices over time, by the mid-'90s, most, most prices were market-determined. But there was very little industrial uh, concentration. So you didn't have a lot of monopoly power where firms were able to gather you know, extra rents by raising prices. 
but now we're in an environment where uh, anti-competitive mergers have become quite important in determining the shape of the economy. And it's a little bit unusual because China does have a very good uh, anti-monopoly law, but there's a subset of big state firms that are not subject to the provisions of the anti-monopoly law. So there's a big central organization I'll talk about in a minute that orchestrates what I call these top-down mergers. So let me uh, go through this, the rollback of reform. Well, this is the same diagram except with a few more years added on to it, and you can see there's this tremendous change. Private firms used to be getting a little bit more than half the credit by 2016. They're down to 11 percent. These data come out with a very long lag. Uh, the 2017 data haven't even been released yet. Um, and the share going to state companies skyrockets, you know, from around a third to more than four-fifths in a relatively short period of time. So a big, big change in the flow of credit in this economy. And I think it is primarily because, as I mentioned earlier, Xi Jinping continually admonished uh, leaders, political and governmental, that state companies must be bigger. So there are several ways you do that. Well, you merge them together so they get bigger automatically. Then you give them more access to credit so they grow some more. And this was a period, of course, when credit was growing very rapidly. So you might think, well, private companies are just getting a, a smaller share of a much bigger pie. But the amount of lending that private companies got in 2013 at the peak was about 2.7 trillion RMB. That's the increase in loans in that year. And in 2016, their new loans were about 600 billion. So not only did their share go down, but the absolute amount of, of new loans that they were getting uh, fell very, very uh, precipitously. <coughs> Um, no surprise, the investment pattern begins to change. After 2011, private companies' investment was still inching up a little bit, but it's nowhere near as steep as in the earlier period. And starting in around 2014, it plateaus out, and now it's been going down. And you can see uh, in the dash line, the share of investment being undertaken by state companies is rising. I think this is the first time this has happened, really, in the entire reform period since uh, 1978. If you look carefully, you'll see that the rise of investment by state companies is greater than the decline in investment by private companies, and that's because state companies are also displacing investment that used to be undertaken by collective firms. There are still a few collective firms hanging around, and the share of investment undertaken by foreign companies is also coming down a little bit. So you have a big boom in the share of investment being undertaken by uh, state companies, which are far, far less efficient than private companies, as I'll show you later. So this is very adverse for economic growth. You have a larger and larger share of investment being undertaken by the least uh, efficient firms. And here's the pattern of industrial growth. Um, up until around 2015, I think, on average, though some variation year to year and who's growing faster and so forth, but on average over this whole period up to 20, roughly up to 2015, private companies were growing twice as fast as state companies. They were more productive, they had higher retained earnings, they were getting reasonable access to credit, and they grew very fast. The state companies grew uh, much, much more slowly. But as a result, I think, of the fact that private companies got less access to credit, um, after, as you saw on the previous diagram, and I, I should add as a, not really a footnote, but a further explanation, is private companies to some extent were able to <clears throat> compensate for their loss of access to bank credit by shifting uh, more and more to rely on so-called shadow banking or non-bank financial institutions. These are the less well-regulated banks, they typically not banks, but institutions that typically charge somewhat higher interest rates. But the Chinese by 2016-17 became quite worried, including Xi Jinping, that financial risks were increasing uh, as a result of this huge buildup of credit relative to GDP. So they decided to slow down the growth of credit, and they concentrated on reducing credit in particular by the shadow banks, because the shadow banks were less well regulated and were believed, probably correctly, to be a potentially greater source of risk uh, 
than the conventional banking system. The conventional banking system had a bank regulator. The shadow banks were, as the name implies, they're kind of, they're in the shadows and no one's shining the spotlight on them to see exactly uh, so uh, in such detail what they're doing. So as they squeezed down shadow banking starting in 2016, that really further squeezed out the access to funding for uh, private firms. And I think they were so constrained that they didn't have adequate working capital and the state companies were getting more and more access to credit and they were increasing uh, their growth picked up quite substantially relative to that of private companies. As you can see, if you look closely, in the last couple of years, state companies are actually growing more rapidly than private companies for the first time in, <coughs> in the reform era. And this is quite important because it's not as if the private companies are in a little niche, you know, as I showed you in the earlier diagram, by 2010, 2011, private companies were producing about 80%. 80, 75, 80% of industrial output. So this is a fairly significant uh, recent uh, development. Now I'm coming to the next uh, element in the re reduced role of the market, and that is the rise of uh, anti-competitive mergers that have been driven by an organization that was created back in 2004 called the State Assets Supervision and Administration Commission, which everybody refers to as SASIC. And SASIC, uh, when it was created, uh, became not exactly the owner, but o the overseer of China's largest non-bank financial institutions, the three, uh, the three big oil companies, the, the big state airlines, uh, the electric power generating companies, the two big electric power distributors, uh, and the list goes on. Originally, they controlled 196 companies, which doesn't sound like very many. But these are all conglomerates. Several of them have more than 100 subsidiaries. And uh, some of them are quite huge. PetroChina, for example, one of the big oil companies, has 817,000 employees. So these were a massive part of the industrial landscape. And they merged them for a while, and then they stopped merging. But in the middle of 2015, the mergers resumed. And the key takeaway from this, just looking at the names, I think you can see fairly quickly, these are mergers within particular industries. Uh, metallurgical companies merging, shipping companies merging, tourism companies merging, uh, building materials uh, companies merging. So industries that already had a little bit of concentration, a little bit of an oligopolistic uh, flavor, if you will, became much more concentrated and much more um, monopolistic in, in character. By last year, the number of firms had been reduced to about 95. So, but they were undertaking all the same activities that they were at the beginning, it's just that they were reorganized into a smaller number of companies. Uh, now, what happened. This diagram maybe has a few too many things on it, but um, look at the middle column, which shows the assets of these companies going from around 10 and, 10 and a half trillion RMB to about 55 trillion RMB, so five, five times bigger. The number of companies cut in half, so the average firm at the end of this period was 10 times bigger than it was at the beginning. Um, how did this affect productivity as measured by return on assets? Well, they were up at around 6 or 7% in their early years, and after they got through with all these mergers, they're down to an average of about 2.5% return on assets in the last, uh, in, in 2015, 16, and 17. So I think this is actually a, a good example of why state companies are dragging down China's economic growth. They control more and more assets. You know, 55 trillion, if you don't know the exchange rate, I'll tell you, 55 trillion is a big number. <laughs> um, it's about 10 trillion US dollars, um, roughly. Um, but their, you know, their productivity declined. So my, my view is, uh, unlike what you might have expected, well, if they're more monopolistic, they should raise their prices and you know, earn rents and have high returns, but they didn't. I think what happened actually was the incentive for innovation was reduced. The incentive for cost control was reduced. Uh, 
and the opportunities for corruption, I think, multiplied. These companies have very little transparency. Some of them have listed subsidiaries, so you get little glimpses into some of the subsidiaries, but none of the big top level, the conglomerate level, the group level companies are listed, so there's no financial information about them. They have huge amounts of, I don't know, what are, somebody from finance should explain this here, what are euphemistically referred to as related party transactions in which you know, money seems to sometimes disappear. Um, and so the, the result is uh, a very inefficient um, big, big state sector. All the big state central non-financial companies are in this uh, universe. The other thing to notice if you are very fast at math, look at the <laughs> profits column subtract off 20, add it up, subtract off this pre-tax profit, so subtract off 25% for the corporate income tax, and you will find an amount of retained earnings that would be sufficient to finance about one-fifth of the increase in assets that occurred over this period. So I think this is an example of a big subset of firms that got more and more access to credit through the banking system, as I showed you in the earlier diagram, and is responsible for the squeezing out of the private sector. It's a little bit surprising because as their productivity as measured by return on assets is steadily sliding down, they're able to get more and more uh, financing either from the banking system or from uh, selling corporate bonds or uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of the subsidiaries uh, get listed or do a secondary uh, offering of equity and, and raise money through the uh, domestic stock markets in, in Shanghai and Shenzhen. So I sometimes say that, you know, one of the things that happened under Xi Jinping was this Made in China 2025 policy that was unveiled in 2015 and designed to push China into the vanguard in 10 uh, critical industries, artificial intelligence and so forth and so on. But this is one of China's longest standing industrial policies, this idea that SASIC was going to transform these companies to become more efficient. And I, I, I don't see much evidence that it worked. So a lot of people in Washington, particularly in the administration, think China has got this brilliant industrial policy called Made in China 2025. It will be flawlessly executed, and China will take over uh, the world's supply of all the things in these 10 products you know, by tomorrow afternoon at the latest. But I, I tend to think it's not necessarily going to work out as uh, some of the, the critics of Made in China 2025. So I, I have a more relaxed view on this industrial policy because I don't think, uh, I think its chances for success are not, uh, not so uh, great. So I just, this is a diagram I should have put in the, at the beginning. This is just to underscore the difference in productivity of state and private firms in the industrial sector. Um, here the interesting observation is that you can see in the late 90s the productivity of state firms was terrible, down around 1%. This was when Zhu Rongji, the uh, premier at the time, launched his big restructuring of state-owned enterprises. Some of them were taken over by management in kind of management buyouts. A few of them went out of business. They were subject to a lot more uh, market discipline. And you can see their productivity uh, improved quite significantly, began to converge towards the productivity level of, of private firms. But something happened after 2006 or seven, where the productivity levels of the two types of firms began to diverge uh, quite significantly. And I think it was a combination of things. So the productivity improvements that we saw in state companies starting in the late 90s were the result of the Zhu Rongji reforms, the increase in competition that occurred as a result of China's negotiation to get into the World Trade Organization. I always emphasize people think China got into the WTO in 2001, and then they started cutting their tariffs and other non-tariff barriers. It was exactly the opposite. They had to cut them before they were able to get in because the other countries rightfully said, well, we've been doing several rounds of tariff reduction since the early 1960s, and when China applied to get in to the WTO, uh, 
in the, in the mid-90s, or maybe even a little bit earlier, their average tariffs were something like 65%. So they had to keep reducing them. By, the, by 2001, they were down to around 10%. They also got rid of a whole slew of licensing requirements. If you wanted to import something, first you had to go to a central government agency and get a license. Some of those imports were also subject to a quota. Only a fixed amount could be imported. So they got rid of all the quotas, they got rid of all the licensing requirements, and cut their tariffs from around 65% down to 10%. All of that was happening in the late 90s. Uh, and so there was a huge increase in competition, uh, if you wanted to, imp you know, if you wanted to import something, you could do do so much more easily at a much lower price. Domestic firms had to up their game in order to compete with those imports. <clears throat> but that was kind of a, you know, those reforms I think began to run out of steam by by the middle of the decade. Uh, it had a very transformative effect early on. Similarly, with Jerome G's reforms, they had a transformative effect for a period of time, but in this intervening period, you may remember, is the, the Hu, um, you know, Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao period in the years leading up to the global financial crisis, and they didn't really undertake such a significant economic reform. So the, the momentum that was there was, uh, was largely uh, lost. Uh, and so since the global financial crisis, you see a very substantial divergence in the productivity of the, of the two types of firms. So I think if you look at this and then go back and look at this, how is it that these state companies are growing more rapidly than private companies? Well, it requires lots and lots of credit if you're having a productivity that's one-third the level of the private firms and you're growing more rapidly, you're chewing up a lot of resources to generate that slightly faster economic growth and I think that's one of the reasons, I, as I said at the outset, I think China's growth is now being dragged down by inefficient state-owned companies. Um, I actually did a little back-of-the-envelope estimate of what this is costing China in terms of economic growth, and the answer is they're, over the last decade, have grown maybe about one and a half to two percentage points per year more slowly than they would have if the productivity of state-owned companies had not deteriorated vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, the productivity of state companies had not deteriorated vis-a-vis private companies. In other words, I'm not saying they had to converge up to the level of uh, private companies, but that their time, time path, the differential did not, would not, if it hadn't widened so much, they would have grown uh, much more uh, rapidly. And then <clears throat> to counter the, the Larry Summers view about convergence to the mean, I th point out that even though China has grown faster for longer than any other country for which we have data, uh, they're currently only at roughly 25% of the U.S. level as measured by international prices or purchasing power parity. Uh, and that simply points out the fact that when reform began in the late 1970s, China was desperately poor. It was roughly at 5% of the U.S. level of per capita output. And if you look at the other successful East Asian modernizers, they began when they were at about 25% of the U.S. level. They, weren't, they didn't all begin at the same time, but at the time they did begin, they were at roughly 25% of the then prevailing U.S. level. So we're talking about Japan, uh, South Korea, Taiwan. And then they grew fairly rapidly uh, for a couple of decades a, or a little bit longer. And at the end of that period of rapid economic growth, uh, South Korea and Taiwan were up to about 55 percent of the U.S. level. Japan was up closer to 60, 65 percent of the U.S. level. So China is only at 25 percent. So I think there is plenty of convergence potential, or another way of saying it is the technology already exists in the world to produce four times more than China is currently producing. Now, obviously, they're going to have to change policies. I think they will have to go back towards uh, more market uh, resource allocation, particularly of capital. I think the main characteristic of this economy over the last <laughs> six or seven years is a massive uh, misallocation of capital. And so they have to go back to a more market-oriented um, capital allocation system. They have to reintroduce policies that encourage competition. They have to introduce policies that encourage uh, 
uh, merger and acquisition activity. One of the problems is there's a massive amount of underperforming assets in the hands of state companies. Uh, well, first of all, even if they're losing money, they don't go out of business. 40% of all Chinese companies, state companies, lose money year after year after year uh, at increasing amounts, and they simply borrow more money from the banking system to cover their losses. So there's no exit. There are very, very few bankruptcies in China. And there's almost no opportunity for more efficient private firms to, to look at the landscape and say, you know, if we had the assets that that state company has, if we could acquire them at a decent price, we could use them much more efficiently and, and produce uh, better economic outcomes. There's very, the kind of merger and acquisition activity they have is this top-down driven merger of these big state companies. What they need is some bottom-up merger where private companies that are more efficient would have an opportunity uh, to buy assets from underperforming uh, companies. So th that's just a, an example of the few things I think they would have to do to capture this potential. <coughs> now I'll just close with one comment and then we'll go to questions. Why, why aren't they doing this? Why, doesn't, why is Xi Jinping operating on the b basis of emphasizing that state companies need to be bigger? Oh, I have to tell you one more anecdote about that. Um, last year, I went to the Boao Forum <clears throat> in, in uh, Hainan Island with their big annual meeting for, you know, they, they used to call it the Asian Davos, I think they still do. Um, and Xiao Yaqing, the man who's the head of SASIC, was on a panel. So I thought, well, I'm going to go to the panel and hear what he says, because uh, he's the guy that's supervising all these big state companies. So just to go back to that. So all he wanted to talk about is how big the companies were. He was talking about the previous year, which would have been 2017. He was bragging. In 2017, the companies under SASIC had revenues of 26 trillion RMB. And they were now national champions. They could compete globally. Uh, and they were you know, China's pride. Well, my, you know, I'm an economist, so I think, well, if you have almost unlimited access to capital, or appears to be unlimited access to capital, and you're not subject to any, you know, it doesn't matter what your return on assets is, it's pretty easy to grow your top line growth. So I think that's the, the problem of these state companies. Um, I think many of them, and I, I think I wrote this in the book, are not really profit maximizing companies. They're asset maximizers. They want to control more assets and they're not particularly concerned if the return on those assets is declining, and apparently their lenders are not particularly concerned if uh, their ability to service their debt is deteriorating uh, because of the decline in assets. So one, one final comment, why are they doing this? Xi Jinping presumably should understand the trade-off. You have over on this side, you have a more market-oriented, more efficient, faster-growing economy, over here, you have a more state-oriented, less efficient, slower-growing economy. But over here, you also get more political control. I think Xi Jinping believes that having a big state sector is an element of political control. And what we have heard from Xi Jinping over and over again is the importance of political control. He has said, I believe on more than one occasion, that the party must control everything, everywhere, all the time. So that's that pretty much covers it. So he, uh, on this theory, then he does understand that he's sacrificing some growth in order to enhance political control, but he thinks it's a trade-off worth making. And the reason there's a question mark at the end of the book title is, I think, well, this may not go, this may not go on forever. Maybe growth will slow down even more, and Xi Jinping will change his mind and decide the price he's paying in terms of slow growth is not worth it, and particularly taking into account the fact that the legitimacy of the party depends on rising living standards, rising wages, and ability of the government to provide more social services, health care, education, uh, spend some money to uh, remediate some of the environmental problems, which are still quite severe. So maybe he'll change his mind, or maybe he won't get his third term, and someone will come in that has a different sense of, of what's important, the control versus uh, efficiency. We now have time for questions. There are two mics on either side, uh, so just raise your hand and recognize one. I uh, use my uh, power here and just ask a question 
Well, there certainly is a debate, and there are certainly uh, some economists uh, that are brave enough to criticize uh, the policies that Xi Jinping has pursued and argues that, that they're very costly. And I think the most recent good example uh, is a man named Luo Ji Wei, who is a very, very strong reformer, been around for a long time, a protege of Zhu Rongji, the former premier. Uh, he was minister of finance, and then he was a little bit too outspoken, so they kicked him out of that position and made him head of the Social Security Administration, which is not exactly a high-level policy job, but allowed him to keep his ministerial rank. But uh, on the sidelines of the National People's Congress, Chinese People's Political Consultative Congress, a, a couple of weeks ago, he gave a press conference in which he launched a blistering attack on Made in China 2025, which is, I don't think he mentioned Xi Jinping, but everybody knows, this is Xi Jinping's signature policy. And he said it should not be up to the government to try to anticipate what sectors of the economy are likely to be more important in the future. The government certainly should not be allocating resources to achieve uh, goals in these sectors, that all of this should be uh, uh, left to the market. And he gave examples that he th uh, thinks uh, demonstrate a huge amount of resource waste that has occurred as a result of these massive uh, policies. I, mean, I think that's one of the reasons lending to, to the state has gone up so much. That a lot of this money is going into, well, they have created thousands of so-called government funds that are designed to promote particular industrial goals, the most famous of which is probably the semiconductor fund, which has spent hundreds of billions of dollars trying to uh, make China uh, self-sufficient in semiconductors. And most of the people that I talk to in the industry say China's actually falling further and further behind. They've poured in tons of money, uh, and they don't have the capacity to make the more sophisticated chips. The best example confirming that view was Huawei, the company that's so criticized in the West, has a new chip that's very advanced, uh, that's in some of their new equipment. They designed it. It could not be built in China. They had to outsource the production to TSMC, which is Taiwan's biggest uh, fab, so semiconductor uh, fabrication facility. So in that area, which is one of the 10 priority areas, they seem to be falling behind. So yes, there is criticism. How, does, how do we judge his, his um, how secure is his position? I think you said, I think it's, well, certainly as an outsider, it's almost impossible to tell. If you look at the vote that occurred uh, at the National People's Congress a, a little more than a year ago, where they revised the Constitution, the state Constitution, so that uh, the president could serve uh, more than two terms, you know, I, I think everybody voted for it. Maybe there were three or four people who didn't vote for it, but a lot of dissatisfaction. A lot of people in the party who felt that one of China's most important successes for an authoritarian, or call it totalitarian if you want to, system that they had put in a system of term limits, so you couldn't have a Mao hanging on forever doing uh, things that weren't so great in the closing years of his life, uh, and you had term limits. So even people at the ministerial level or state councilor level or Politburo or Politburo Standing Committee, the top people would have to step down at advertised ages. Uh, so they felt that that was a big accomplishment for the Chinese system, and a big part of that went out the window when they voted to amend the Constitution, which specifically limits the term of president to two terms, two five-year terms. Uh, so those people are also against, very quietly, however. <laughs> Raise your hand, the microphone goes. Yeah, here's a question here, and a microphone. Uh, I want, um, hi, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the Belt and Road Initiative and to what extent that is related to this resurgence of the state sector and the decline and uh, um, misallocation of capital and resources. Well, that's, uh, the Belt and Road is, a, is, remember, in so many ways, a bit of a black box because you don't have very good data on, on the money. But I don't think uh, 
it has a big effect on the lending data that I showed you because what's happening is that uh, China is lending a lot of money, but mostly to foreign governments or foreign agencies that are undertaking projects, you know, transport, roads, railroads, electric power generation facilities, other types of infrastructure. So not so much of the lending goes directly to state companies. What happens is the loans go to these foreign governments. They let the contracts, typically it seems to be the case that Chinese firms are selected through a very untransparent, uh, not very competitive process. So, I th and the, the biggest beneficiaries are ten, the 10 largest <coughs> state construction and engineering corporations that are doing most of the belt and road work. But I don't think they're borrowing very much money from the banking system. The money first goes to the foreign governments or a foreign uh, agency, you know, electric power uh, commission or whatever, and then the contracts go to the state companies. So the state companies do benefit from it, but I don't think it's had a big effect on that um, ramping up in the share of domestic lending going to state companies. Yeah. Uh, hi, um, <clears throat> thank you for your talk. In our macroeconomics class, we read an article about how China has been overstating its GDP. And since you work on Chinese economics, um, I was wondering, in the process in which you're conducting research or writing your book, how did you go about collecting data? Can you trust that data? And what concerns um, arise? Well, the this is, uh, the question of Chinese data is one that has preoccupied people that have tried to understand the Chinese economy for a long, long time. I will put my cards on the table. I think the data, for the most part, is reasonably good. There are some kinds of data that may be perfectly accurate, but are not very useful. Historically, the, the data on unemployment fell into that category because the denominator, the definition of the labor force was only those people that had permanent urban status. So migrant workers were never counted as part of the labor force. So in the spring of 2009, and when the global financial crisis was at its worst and China's exports were plummeting, a government survey showed that 20 million migrant workers had lost their jobs in the export sector. The unemployment figure didn't change <laughs> because those people, those people aren't part of the labor force. So the number may be perfectly accurate, but it doesn't, it's not telling you what you really want to know, how has you know, the global downturn affected employment. Um, now, I think the GDP figures are generally reliable. I, I don't put too much emphasis on anything to the right of the decimal place. Um, and to those who say that, you know, all these numbers are, you know, manufactured by the statistical authorities to make things look good, I point to stuff like this. If they're really making all this up, why do they want to make state companies look so bad? relative to private companies. So um, I think that's perhaps the most telling piece of evidence that, that they, are, they have limited resources uh, and there are lots of, it's a big complicated economy, but I think the, um, the data are, are in general pretty reliable. And I'd never use something like this to make a, you know, a huge detailed estimate. I mean, I just wanna say, you know, somehow after 2007 state companies performance deteriorated significantly relative to private companies. And you know, what, at, at, you know, at the peak, I think it's about four to one, and some years it's three to one. Whether it's three to one or four to one, it's a big, big gap, maybe not measured perfectly, but certainly of a magnitude that suggests that private companies are a lot more efficient. So I wanted to ask about uh, kind of the logics and mechanics of, I guess, the gap in credit availability for public and private firms right now. Uh, you mentioned that a lot of it is some kind of leniency for public companies not really having to service their debt quite as well as private companies have. Is there also kind of a divergence in rate that public companies are being asked to pay lower interest rates? And if so, why hasn't that been addressed with some kind of like commercial paper market or anything else as China really tries to keep private personal investment within the country if there are opportunities to finance private companies? Well, <clears throat> I think th this is a complicated question. I think in all economies, small startup companies don't, you know, if you had a great idea for starting a new business and walked into Chase Bank, they probably 
let's say get lost, if you, where's your collateral, <laughs> et cetera. So uh, startup companies, I think, in all economies have a hard time getting access to the formal banking system. Uh, I think bigger, when companies get bigger in China, at least historically, they were able to get credit, as I showed in the diagram. And a th lot of survey data show that the bigger private companies were paying interest rates not very different from state companies. Uh, but as they had to shift into shadow banking, remember shadow banking started to grow rapidly about the time that private companies were losing access to bank loan lending. The rates in shadow banking are much, much higher. So it was kind of a double whammy. They lost access to bank credit for the most part, and they were, had to shift into the shadow banking where interest rates were much higher. Now, why don't, you know, why don't they develop, uh, I mean, the way of summarizing the second part of your question is, why don't they have a less bank-dominated financial system? Most, um, you know, they do have a corporate bond market. It's actually, in absolute terms, one of the largest in the world, but compared to the flow of lending through the banking system, it's still fairly small. And the same thing is true for uh, the stock market. There are, you know, maybe now three and a half thousand listed companies, but there are more than, uh, there are roughly about two million private companies that are organized as limited liability companies, in other words, the bigger private companies. Some private companies got listed, but most of the companies that are listed on the stock market are still state companies. And most of, the, um, most of the equity being raised in recent years is being raised by state companies. There are a lot of small IPOs of private companies, but the biggest funding through the equity market is secondary issues, which are heavily, heavily dominated by uh, state companies uh, that, that were already listed. So um, it's not a mechanism for, private companies are not compensating for problems in accessing the bank market by getting more money from the bond market or the equity market. Okay. I, I have a question. Um, who's giving all the credit? If it's a credit-driven expansion in the state-owned enterprises, are there state-owned banks? Because you really didn't talk about the financial sector and the dominance of the state in the financial sector. And the second and related question is, if the, real, the performance is really this abysmal, um, we've heard a little bit of rumbling about a potential debt crisis in China, and, and I'd like to know what your view is of that. Yeah. Well, I should have mentioned uh, somewhere near the outset that the banking system is almost 100% state-owned. There are a couple of very <coughs> small institutions, uh, smaller banks that are, could be regarded as privately owned, and uh, both Tencent and Alibaba have now started up uh, small private banks. One of them is my bank and the other one's WeBank. Uh, and they're virtual banks. They're, they don't have any brick and mortar. But, and they're growing rapidly, but they're an infinitesimal sliver of the banking system. So it's basically uh, a state-dominated banking system. So this lending is all within the state sector. It's state banks lending to state companies. And, um, <coughs> You know, the, the, the bank, you know, the bank leadership is mostly appointed by the party. They're, they have an organization department that fills the top jobs in the big industrial firms and in the big state banks. The top three people are appointed by the organization department of the party. And, you know, when Xi Jinping says state companies have to be bigger, they, they, uh, they get the message and they lend more to state companies. And I think that's, that's what's been happening. Um, so far, uh, to take the second part of your question, uh, they have had some success in bringing down the, ra the rate of growth of credit relative to GDP. So the, that leverage ratio has begun to come down. Uh, 2018 was the slowest growth of credit in many, many years. Um, so financial risks are maybe receding, uh, not only because overall credit is going down, but the credit through the more riskier parts of the financial system is, is, coming, is actually shrinking uh, in absolute terms, not just growing more slowly. The real problem is, um, of course, all these institutions are ultimately working with deposits that are coming from the public. And, uh, you know, so some people say, well, it's, you know, the state lending to the state, so this kind of thing can go on forever. But, uh, sure, it can go on forever, but at a very high cost to the public. And the, China is 
historically been characterized by a very high degree of financial repression. I wrote about this in a book about 15 years ago. Deposit rates were extremely low. They were in <coughs> negative territory most of the time. That allowed corporates to borrow at a very low uh, rate. Um, but it created all kinds of distortions. Household income was suppressed because uh, the real returns were negative year after year after year. Households tried to compensate by saving even more because they were doing target saving for retirement or health care potentially down the road when they didn't have a very good social safety net. So the household savings rate uh, kept going up and up and up, and it led to a lot of distortions and imbalances in the economy. So it's not it's not a free lunch. Uh, you know, I always characterize it by saying, you know, the depositors are not going away. So if the borrowers can't pay the money, I mean, the only way, the, you know, the banks were completely recapitalized uh, at around 1999, 2000. Um, and <clears throat> it was basically depositors that were paying the price. Now, things have gotten better in the last seven, eight, nine years, real interest rates have inched, uh, for depositors have inched into positive uh, territory. But so the whole question is, how can you run a banking system when you're lending so much money to firms that have low returns and a very big subset of them are losing money, which means they can't cover uh, their interest payments. Um, so that's why I believe the, the solution is a more market-oriented approach that would allow merger and acquisition activity. You would force these money-losing companies to sell assets, to get them in the hands of firms that could use them more efficiently. The proceeds from the assets could be used to pay off a, a large chunk of the loans that these companies are currently unable to, to service. But they have no incentive to do that. They don't have to sell assets. They just keep borrowing more to cover their losses. Last chance. Follow-up question about uh, the shadow banking sector. Um, I was uh, Kelly Tsai has written a little bit about this. I don't know if you know her, Kelly Tsai. She's at uh, University oh, of Hong Kong. Yeah. yeah, but the my understanding is that the shadow banking sector is closely connected to the state banking sector in the sense that banks, because they are offering these low rates to on um, loans, that they want to get a higher return somewhere else. So they sort of do this off balance sheet lending um, to private companies. Um, to what extent has the crackdown on shadow banking affected the returns to the, to the banking sector and the state banking sector? Well, the, the, premise, the premise of your question is absolutely correct. The shadow banks and the banks are intimately interrelated, interrelated, and it goes back to what I was just talking about, deposits. Shadow banks typically do not take deposits. So how do they fund themselves? They fund themselves primarily by borrowing money on the interbank market. So you have some of the big state banks that have a branch on seemingly every street corner of every city. They take in a lot more deposits than they can lend out. So they lend them out in what some people call the wholesale market or what you would call the interbank market. And a lot of the borrowers are, are non-bank financial institutions. They use that money to finance their activity. Uh, and many of those uh, non-bank financial institutions have a very close relationship with a, with a bank. So um, it's a, a triangular relationship. When a bank can't lend any more money to a, cu a customer because uh, they haven't paid their loans or they're in default, they, they lend money to the non-bank financial institution through the shadow banking, uh, through the interbank market, and then, the, then that, that institution lends the money to the original customer. And they take a, a security from the non-bank financial institution, so the banks don't show it as a loan on their books. They show it as an investment. We have an investment in a product from the shadow bank, but it's backed by a loan to the same dodgy borrower. So it's, uh, there, there are lots of, uh, lots of interconnections, and I think that's why the regulators and the top political leadership recognize that there were a lot of risks with the shadow banking system, and that's why they're trying to scale it back. A lot of this activity is coming back onto bank balance sheets, and bank earnings are not doing well in recent years, and that interest margins are getting squeezed. I know some students have some questions here. We have one student here, but I know there are others. Life, lifetime student. Okay. <laughs> um, I, was, I, was most in the debt, I was most interested in the debt, debt question, but a, a related question is if um, 
private enterprises are being crowded out in the in the credit markets. Um, admittedly, it's a one-party state and a pretty brutal one when it needs to be. But is there any kind of uh, blowback from the private sector? Are they exporting assets? You know, China is no longer the lowest labor uh, place on earth. What uh, what has the reaction of the private sector been to this? Because it's it's got to be a drag on their earnings as well. Well, um, let me bring in one factor that I didn't mention, and that that is that in addition to the squeezing out, uh, which I think has been a very important problem in recent years, uh, there has been inadequate protection of intellectual proper of, of private property rights, and there have been some well um, publicized cases where the the firms of private entrepreneurs have been taken over by the state. Usually, they're the entrepreneur is accused of doing something illegal, tax violation or something, and uh, he goes to jail and the, the penalty is he gives, up, he gives up his company. So maybe one of the reasons that private investment is slowing down in addition to the squeezing out is what you were alluding to. Maybe, you know, under Xi Jinping, they have reestablished party committees in all enterprises, even private enterprises are now uh, required to have a party committee that's supposed to oversee the main uh, strategy of firms. So if you're a private entrepreneur that has built up your company and all of a sudden you can't get access to bank credit anymore, if you want to borrow, you have to go to shadow banking and pay a very high interest rate, and then even that starts to shrink, and then uh, the party committee is installed in your business, you say, hey, maybe, maybe I don't want to put all my profits back into the business. I'm going to take some of them offshore. I'm going to you know, buy property in Australia or Vancouver or, or, or wherever they can um, move their money. So that's another possible explanation of this weakening of private investment. I can't disentangle these two things, but I think it's some combination of squeezing out inadequate protection of private property. And how do you know there's inadequate protection? Well, two years ago, combined the state council, which is the highest level of the government, and the Chinese Communist Party Central Committee put out a joint directive calling for better protection of private property rights. Well, why, do they, why are they calling for it? Well, because it's not there, <laughs> uh, at least to the degree they'd like it to be there. So uh, there has been a lot of recognition of the problems that private entrepreneurs have faced. Uh, Xi Jinping, um, six or eight months ago, met with private entrepreneurs and said all kinds of nice things. We understand how important private firms are to the economy, and we will do things to make it better. The bank regulator started putting out new uh, incentive programs to encourage banks to lend to private companies. They did that starting uh, at the beginning of 2018. It had no effect on bank lending. The amount of lending going to private companies did not go up at all. So I think when you're on this trajectory of you know, huge increase, and it's going to take a long time to turn this, to turn this around. Last question must go to a, oh, let's go. Now we have some students raising their hands. <laughs> Fine, okay. Uh, just going back to the banking sector, uh, with last year's merger of uh, China's banking and insurance uh, regulators into the CBIRC, uh, you know, what are some of the uh, implications for the banking sector that we might have not s discussed here? Well, um, the merger uh, is secondary. In my opinion, the most important thing that has happened is that Guo Xuqing, a very, very strong reformer, has put, been put in charge of this combined regulator. The, the, Insurance regulator was very weak. They allowed Anbang to this big insurance company to diversify in all, into all kinds of offshore assets that were outside of its core business. So they canned that guy. They got rid of him. They pushed the insurance regulator into the banking regulator, and they have put in a very, very strong um, uh, regulator in charge of that. And he's done. He's. I think he's moving everything in the right direction. He's. He's cut off the flow of investment, by outbound investment by Chinese companies that are, you know, buying sports teams and doing all kinds of things. You know, football, soccer teams in, in the UK, uh, et cetera. H and A has been under enormous pressure. Uh, Anbang is another one. They were prohibited from issuing any new policies for quite a few months. Um, they they were um, 
they issued these policies called term life insurance. They have very high interest rates. The terms are typically six months. Who buys a life insurance policy for six months? It was a way of, it wasn't, it was a way of getting around, the, it was a way of attracting investment so they had a huge flow of money in uh, into these products and that's how they financed a lot of acquisitions. So the insurance regulators, uh, when Gua Xu Ching took over, he said, you can't sell these kinds of policies anymore. In fact, for Anbang, they were not allowed to sell any policies for months. And they'd issued all these policies with high interest rates in short term. They had a tremendous maturity mismatch. All their assets were in long-term things, and they were having to, they could only keep this short-term insurance going as long as more and more people were buying it. It was, it was basically a Ponzi scheme, classic Ponzi scheme as far as I can. So that was, that was chopped off. Uh, so the person to watch there is Guo Ching. So I recently read that um, Chinese banks have been reducing their reserve requirements, and there's a lot of talk about how Trump's protectionist policies are actually hurting China, and that that's causing the reserve requirements to drop. So what do you think about Trump's policies and China's reactions? Well... Well, with Doug Irwin in the room, I have to go along with his view that tariffs are not usually a very good solution to anything. Um, I think they've imposed a very high cost, not just on China, but on, on U.S. companies as well. And I, it, I think it remains to be seen uh, how much uh, Trump's negotiators are going to extract in terms of concessions by the Chinese. Of course, there are, you know, there are, uh, there's a subset of people in China who want to move economic reform forward who say, this is very good. We are glad that Trump is uh, demanding uh, reforms that will make China more market-oriented, a more level playing field for foreign and, and uh, domestic companies, uh, more protection for intellectual property, and so forth. Um, of course, I worry that the demands have become so far-reaching that Xi Jinping won't be able politically to make the kinds of commitments that that uh, Lighthizer and Mnuchin are looking for. He does not want to be seen as capitulating to foreign pressure. So my view is this is not a linear relationship. A little bit of pressure probably is a very good thing, but at some point, which of course I can't identify, uh, there's a tipping point and it could become counterproductive. But uh, I don't think we're gonna get a final resolution uh, at the end of this month or next month or whenever people are predicting. I think what we're going to have is not a peace treaty, but a ceasefire. I think Trump could easily go back to more tariffs and unilateral uh, action uh, at some point in the future. Can, you, uh, so can you discuss your uh, concerns regarding the instabilities that the global markets will experience once um, they're exposed to the rot and malinvestment in the Chinese banking system? as the economy opens up? Um, well, I think, the, I think the lesson of recent decades is the Chinese economy opens up relatively slowly, and we're certainly seeing that in the financial sector now. You know, Chinese bonds are getting put into various bond indices, more Chinese stocks are going into, uh, you know, the MSCI type indices, so the amount of foreign capital going into China's bond market and its equity market uh, is increasing, but it's still basically a very domestically oriented system and uh, not a lot of, uh, you know, cross-border exposures. But your question is, you know, looking ahead. Um, I, I think it depends on how, fast, on how fast they open up and how quickly they can improve their regulatory system. I think this is the underlying problem. If you're lending more and more money to firms that on average have very low returns and 40% of them are losing money, I think they have concealed a massive problem of non-performing loans. Um, they even have admitted this. China's been pretty good on sticking to Basel standards on loan, on loan classification and um, capital adequacy and so forth and so on. But back in around 2012, 13, I don't remember exactly when, they introduced, uh, most, most countries are on the five-tier loan classification system, which is fairly standard, but they introduced a wrinkle called overdue but not impaired. So if a, if a bank hadn't been any, some, a, a repayment or an interest payment was overdue for more than 90 days, the bank on its own 
could avoid classifying it as non-performing by putting it into this separate category called overdue but not impaired. And it was supposed to be based on an assessment of the collateral that stood behind the loan or whether or not there was a guarantor of the loan by a guarantor, by a, a third party guarantor. Well, you know, this is very, very dicey. And, and, you know, once things start going south, the collateral you thought was worth X could easily end up being worth one tenth X. And loan guarantors in China uh, are, I, I quite frankly think they're a joke. They have almost no capital and they go around guaranteeing loans, and that allows people to pretend, uh, extend and pretend, as they call it, uh, in the banking business. So um, I think there's still a, a significant problems be, that are not, have not been revealed. You know, the banking regulator says that um, only one point something percent of the loans are non-performing. But to his credit, one of the first things Guo Shuqing did, this overdue but not impaired category has to be eliminated. Banks are no longer going to be allowed to classify loans in that, in that box. So that's putting some teeth uh, and trying to improve things. We have time for one last question from a student. We have someone down here. Thank you for coming today. Um, I just wanted, you'd spoken about this very briefly earlier. It was the concept of a collective company. I just kind of wanted to know where it fit in on this public-private spectrum and how things have changed um, under the economic performance in terms of productivity, uh, capital inflows. Because I think Huawei is actually one of these collective companies because I know it doesn't describe itself as a private company, but where does it fit in? I was just wondering. Well, <clears throat> this question about what's public and what's private is complicated, but I think the Chinese have adopted a practice that I think is commendable. They they used to go primarily on a firm's registration status, but they, starting about 15 or 20 years ago, they just started to classify companies based on control concepts. So they're no longer state companies and private companies. It's state control or private control. So uh, if it's an LLC, um, if the state is the sole majority or dominant owner, it's considered to be state controlled. If it's private, then it's private control. Then they even have special rules like for joint ventures in the automotive sector where it, all the JVs are 50-50, those companies are automatically classified as state controlled. Um, so you can still have some anomalies here and there, but I think this idea of classifying uh, companies by, the, by you know, who's the dominant owner, and this applies whether it's listed or not listed, um, because any LLC, you, you know, in the Articles of Incorporation, you have to identify who the owners are. So um, that's the basis for classification. If you have a question, please come on down and meet uh, Mr. Lardy. Otherwise, thank you, Nicholas Lardy. Oh, thank you.